Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art and Talk. Thank you so much for being with us today. Today, we have a guest who is a poet. She's a writer, and she's also an editor. And she has a book that's been recently published called Multiverses, and we'll be finding out what that's all about. If you're new to Art and Talk, thank you for being with us. Art and Talk is all about meeting artists and being inspired. We embrace the traditional arts and we embrace the spiritual arts to bring you diverse and quality interviews to watch and to be inspired by. So again, thank you so much for being with us. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk, and I'd like to welcome our guest for today. Her name is Celia Lissette Alvarez. Celia, welcome. Thank you so much, Leslie. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I am from Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, I have uh, an MFA in creative writing from the University of Miami. I've been teaching and writing poetry professionally for over 20 years. And uh, now I'm the editor of uh, Prospectus, a literary offering. And um, I'm here today because I, I had uh, my book Multiverses come out in, in May. And um, it is a, a very special book to me because it is about the death of my infant son. Um, it's a memoir in verse, um, pretty much recounting the years surrounding what happened. Um, I, in 2018, I gave birth to twins, but I gave birth extremely prematurely. And um, the girl, Sarah, is alive and well, and she's three years old right now. Um, but my little boy, Arturo, didn't make it. Um, so he's the inspiration for this book. So um, if you'd like, I, I could read a poem to start off with. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so um, the book is, um, like I said, a memoir in verse, but it is also a series of fantasies interspersed with the memoir, thus the name Multiverses. But what I'm going to read to you is um, the first poem in the book, which is part of uh, the version one sequence, which is the, the memoir, the truth. Okay, very good. Um, version 1.00. In the NICU, they try to reassure me with stories of babies born at 23 weeks who have survived just like you and I, no mark of this struggle of wires and buttons, dials and digital heartbeats. Born at 27 weeks, Arturo is more fetus than baby. I gasp the first time I see them, my twins, Arturo and Sarah. In the violet light of the incubator, I struggle to make out the color of their hair or their eyes. The only way that I can tell them apart is that Sarah's hat has a jaunty bow. Try to remain positive, they say. They let me change their diapers. Arturo's eyes slit slightly open, flash of black, amphibious. I give him the tip of my finger and his hand curls around it like a kitten's paw. He is intubated the tape covering his lower face like a mask. His chest is covered by sensors. Even the preemie diaper reaches to his armpit. All that I can see, because they cannot cover it in order to have a place from which to draw blood, is his left foot, a bulbous big toe standing straight up in the air, just like mine just like mine, this is my son. Even when the crash cart comes in, even when I can no longer tell which doctor can save him, I believe that things will turn around. When the beep of his heartbeat goes silent, I clutch my husband and watch my son turn purple, beginning with his toe. This is my son, I say to myself, when I can finally hold him free from tubes and tape. 
I think of the multiverse theory, wondering what version of me can hold him alive and breathing. What version of me can take him home and watch him grow? Sarah's hair is golden, her eyes a streaming blue river. She squeals with laughter as my mother makes her airplane sounds with her spoon. I think of that version of me where there are two toddlers, skin so white you can see their map of veins. I trace Sarah's blue highways to her big toe, bulbous, alert, ready to spring into action. Thank you. Celia, that is so beautiful and so well written. And I just want to commend you for being able to express so beautifully some very, very difficult emotions and a very difficult situation that you uh, went through and then had to process. Um, you take us there, like we are right there with you, um, just um, as you, you know, opened up uh, in the beginning of your, your book, Multiverses. Um, how soon from when Arturo um, had um, passed on, did you get the um, inspiration uh, for this and actually started to write? What, can you kind of give us a little bit of a time passage on that? Yes, I um, immediately after he died, I started fantasizing um, because my, my daughter Sarah remained in the NICU for 66 days afterwards. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't um, smooth, just to, to put it, you know, mildly. So as I would hold her and I would be with her, I would fantasize about what it would have been like if both of them had lived. And, um, and I found these fantasies soothing. Um, so at some point, it just occurred to me that, um, you know, I was, I was thinking of multiverses. I had always thought of that concept as very intriguing. I'm, I'm not a physicist, so I can't explain it in those terms, but um, in my Star Trek kind of imagination, you know, there's other places where we are ourselves, but slightly different. Um, I didn't act on it though until um, almost, uh, almost two and a half, three years um, after he um, died. It was when the pandemic began that I started um, writing. I found myself um, a stay-at-home mom and um, my father had died um, recently as well in, in 2019. And um, I sat in my father's room and I started writing. And within two weeks, I had this book. So it was in there the whole time in my head. Um, and it finally came out um, right around um, the start of the pandemic. Two weeks. Wow. That's, um, that's, that, that, I think you worded it beautifully in saying that it was in your head. And so all you had to do was take pen and paper or, or be at the computer, how, however you, you know, like to kind of channel and, and focus your writing. And then it was there. So all you had to do was just kind of give it that avenue of expression. I suppose I had been in denial. Um, you know, it took a lot to um, continue focusing on my daughter um, after he died. I didn't have time to grieve. So um, all those emotions and all those feelings and all those ideas had to be suppressed in order to continue. I had my daughter and I had my elder daughter who um, is not much older. <laughs> She's only 11 months older than, uh, than Sarah. So I had to take care of them. Um, but then, um, after I stopped working and I found myself at home and the pandemic started and we all found ourselves at home, I guess I finally had enough time to allow myself to revisit those feelings and those memories and give shape to them. Um, so that's why I think I, I wrote it so fast. I would write one poem and immediately I would have an idea for the next one. Mm -hmm. And the significance of, of your father, um, who you mentioned had passed on as well in 2019, 
And, and now you find yourself um, in his room. It was like an office or study space. Um, no, it was his, um, his bedroom and I took my laptop there. Um, you know, it was a private space. Uh, our home isn't very large, so I, I don't have a, a room of my, my own as Virginia Woolf would, would call it. Um, so it was a private space where the, the girls would um, let me be and let me write. And my husband was wonderful in, in taking care of them so that I could do that. Um, and I felt, gosh, it's hard to explain my father's presence in that room. Um, and I was also breathing very deeply for him. And I think that that sort of set off um, these, these emotions again for me as well. Um, I lost him and I lost my uncle Arturo for whom, whom my son had been named. Um, and um, he died in 2017. He didn't have a chance to, uh, to know about his, uh, his namesake. So it was really, it's a, it was a, a very intense four years of my life. I had two miscarriages and I had my daughter, Lucy, and she was perfect and very healthy. So we said, okay, let's try one more time. And then that's when I got pregnant with the twins and we thought everything was going well um, until I went into labor at, um, at 24 weeks. So um, very intense, many losses. Um, and then my, my um, daughter comes home and I lose my father. So all of that is in multiverses and, and more. <laughs> so multiverses is a combination of um, the loss that you were experiencing um, on a lot of different levels. And would it be correct, Celia, to say multiverses is almost like a alternate parallel universe where you exist simultaneously. So on, at one level, you're you know, experiencing uh, the loss of your father, as you mentioned, and then um, with uh, your son Arturo, and yet you're kind of bringing into a space of like potential where um, that situation didn't occur or is not occurring, and you're actually raising and uh, being with Arturo and everybody else, and it's just a continuation, and it's it's an alternate parallel universe. There are actually four um, parallel universes in the, in the book. Um, and um, the version number one is, is the real one. There's a number two, there's a number three, and then there's a, a number four. Um, I can read you a poem from version two that will show you how it works. It's the same. Um, well, sort of the same moment, but uh, under better circumstances. This is um, version 2.00. The nurses clap and cheer as I exit the NICU. A baby in each arm and one behind. Now big sister Lucy, still just one. We've gone into debt to buy a Honda Odyssey, the only minivan to fit comfortably three car seats. I wait by the curb on the street, pink and blue balloons bouncing from my wheelchair. And Raphael pulls up, the proud papa, takes a picture of us before we struggle to get each baby in a car seat. The Montesmobile, we will call it, as well as the three seat stroller I spent months researching finally settling on a train, figuring that a side by side would not maneuver well down the aisles at Publix, where little hands would reach to grab a bright box of cereal. As we exit the hospital, I look in the rear view mirror, see the lunch lady that was so nice. And I turn towards the road home, only green lights ahead and behind me, a cacophony of cries I will have to find a way to soothe. Anxious and weak, I breathe in the whispering air of the new van and wonder what version of me will be capable of such work. How we will eat, how we will sleep, how we will bathe, how will I coordinate such needs? Too many questions. 
I settle into the bucket seat of the van, try to stockpile the comfort I know I will lack in the coming years. A mixture of fear and joy propels us into our cramped home where every corner will soon be covered with toys, diaper boxes, teething rings, and pacifiers. Thank you. Yeah. When you were writing this, and I love the structure, there's like these four like um, different, um, as you said, like multiverses within this one multiverse. And um, as you were writing this particular um, second um, multiverse, where it's, as you said, it was, you know, getting better as a whole different dynamic, a whole different uh, scenario that's going on. Did, how, how are you processing it? Um, I know you said that, it, you know, it, the whole concept, you know, very much um, helped you to come to terms with, with so much loss and, and how to, you know, deal with the pain and, and to, to move through it and, and, you know, arrive at, at some point of, of acceptance. So through writing this particular part that you just read, um, how did it um, help you in terms of like the healing and the process and just your emotions and, and you know, the, the reality of it yet sort of expanded at this point? It was painful. It was painful to think along these lines um, because of course, these were things that, that were never going to happen. So as I was writing, um, you know, it was a very intense experience, but now that it's all said and done, um, I think that I feel very good about it because I've kind of brought back to life my son and my father and my uncle in the pages of this book. You know, they are no longer with us, but I somehow managed to help them continue a little bit more than they actually had a chance to. And to me, that's a tremendous gift because I needed that. I needed that desperately. Um, it was the kind of life that I had um, envisioned for myself and my family unquestioned until, um, you know, disaster struck. So um, in that sense, yes, it was very helpful to me in, in finally um, not coming towards an acceptance, you know, that you, one, one can never accept something like this, but um, in finding a way to carry it with me without constantly breaking down, which is what was happening to me at first. You know, when I came home with uh, my daughter, I, I would take care of her and I would shut myself in the bathroom and cry um, because I was I was doing these two things simultaneously. I was, you know, I had, um, as a friend of mine put it, you know, joy in one hand and despair in another. So writing this book helped me to take that despair and contain it um, a little bit. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, absolutely. You, you explained that very well. And I feel like there's almost a sense um, as you were elaborating, Celia, that it was almost, um, a way to kind of bring a sense of eternity and a sense of like continuation and honor and um, a memorial, but yet a, a continuation. That's kind of like the feel I'm getting with um, both your uncle, your dad, and, and your son as well. Would, is that kind of like in the right ballpark? Definitely, definitely. As long as this book is in print, and let's face it, maybe not made, <laughs> not many people might read it, but as long as it's out there, they live. You know, they live through this uh, this book, and I can pick it up, and I can read it, and I can see them, and I can hear their voices, and I, for one moment, have the life that I thought that I would have. You know, um, my son certainly was not meant to die. Babies should never die. Um, I was very lucky to have my uncle up until he was ninety seven. Um, but the timing of it was terribly cruel that he wouldn't live to, to meet my daughter or to know my intention of, of naming my son after him. If only he had lived just one more year, you know, he would have known that. And I know that it would have pleased him, although obviously he would have been 
you know, very sad about his passing. And uh, my father lived to be 87, which is also a, a good long life. Um, but he had such a wonderful relationship to his granddaughters that it's a shame that he couldn't live a little bit longer to see them grow. So in this book, they do, they can. So um, it makes me, it makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a beautiful way to honor their life and, and your life as well. I, I hope so. You know, I, it, it also might seem a, a bit odd, I, I think. Um, but um, I, I like to think of it more as, as a tribute, you know, as, as my writing down my memories, specifically for my daughters as well, uh, who are too young to understand what happened. Um, I talked to them about their little brother in heaven. And um, they, of course, got to meet my father, but he died when they were two and three. So I try to keep his memory alive by talking about him, showing them pictures. And, but, you know, the chances are that they are not going to be able to have this be a vivid memory for them. But maybe one day they'll be old enough to read this book and they will, um, be able to see what it felt like for me to go through this and how they were involved and and what it was like so this book is for them mm -hmm. right that's so beautiful um let's go ahead and move into the the third multiverse and kind of get a, a feel into that um sure um let's see the third one is a little bit funny because there's some humor in this too. Um, my, I had my children quite late in life. <laughs> that is why I hurried up so much to try to have uh, what I thought would be our last child when um, my first child was so young. So this, this reflects upon that. This is uh, version 3.1. We are in the elevator at Whole Foods when the nice American lady asks, the inevitable question, are these the only children you have? People always assume there's one off at college somewhere and the girls are some last minute IVF attempts to save our pointless marriage. Another popular scenario is when strangers compliment Raphael whose beard has gone white for his beautiful granddaughters. These spur him to dye his beard a tragic event where his skin becomes brown and the hair remains white. He shaves off the white parts and attempting to sport a very hipster goatee, but the dyed skin beneath makes him look like Fred Flintstone. At night, I stare at myself in the bathroom mirror, scrutinizing my face for signs of age. I have not gotten the grandmother compliment, not yet. I search soaps and toners, serums and oils, eye creams and moisturizers. My bedtime routine takes so long, Raphael comes to call it my Cirque du Fas. Every night as I exfoliate and moisturize, I chide myself for our long wait. When we finish our PhDs, when we get good steady jobs, when we get a house of our own, one morning I was suddenly 36, the next I was 40. I can't help but think something is missing, some bungle in our past that would have turned out differently with the flap of a butterfly's wings, some version of our family in some alternate universe where I am a young mother surrounded by three smiling children. That's version three. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, we get a real feel and, and insight into also the way that, you know, your, your mind kind of moves and kind of thinks about all these different um, aspects that I imagine um, is kind of spills out into other areas of your life as well. Hmm. Yes. Yes, I, I, I think so too. I think ever since I, I, I wrote this book, I, I, have, <laughs> I have 
have trouble hanging on to reality, you could say. Um, but uh, this book was a real departure for, for me. I normally don't go about writing books this way. I normally write poems first and you know you, you accumulate a certain amount and you notice a theme and you put them together, you organize them, you write to the gaps and you know that's that's how I've written before. Uh, but in this case, the concept became the the primary, um, feature of the book, and I wrote to that concept. So um, I got to tell you, it was easier to do it that way, uh, to have such a strong feeling for what it was that I wanted to do, much easier than um, trying to work backwards and see what it is that's been on my mind and giving a shape to that. Um, perhaps it was a subject matter, you know, that this was something that was very vivid to me and, and I, I didn't need to fish for an organization. It was already there, um, both the realities and the, and the fantasies. Can you touch upon, Celia, in your poetry, what were some of the themes and subject matter that you would uh, typically write about? Um, for example, um, my I have two chapbooks chap books other than um, than this book, and they are both sort of um, one is a coming of age um, kind of, of book called Shape Shifting, um, very self centered, you know, very much about my experiences uh, growing up and trying to fulfill the expectations of of others um, and dealing with my past. Um, my immigrant past, which I haven't mentioned, um, but uh, my parents came from uh, from Cuba. In um, they left Cuba actually in 1969, uh, fleeing from the communist regime, and they spent four years in Spain, where I was born, and then we all relocated here in Miami. So that was kind of like a a conflict in terms of my identity. I, I feel I'm totally assimilated. <laughs> I feel. I watched the Brady Bunch and the Partridge family growing up, you know, I, so it was very difficult for me to associate those parts of my personality together. Um, so shape shifting is about that. And then um, the stones is about my, my Hispanic culture and sort of how it is viewed um, by others many times. Uh, it's such a weird feeling when you see yourself represented. Um, by someone else, you know, you, you get reduced in a way to certain tropes. Um, for, for us Cubans here in Miami, it's, it's the Guayabera, it's the Mojito, it's the Coiba cigar, it's the beaches, it's the cafe. Um, and, and that's really, you know, sure it's part of our culture, but it's, it's very limiting. Um, and I, I always found that um, upsetting, you know, in a, in a light sort of way. <laughs> So I, I was writing about that um, in, the, in those two collections. Um, so the political, the personal, I guess you could say, uh, whereas this is very, very much just deeply personal and doesn't really connect that much to the, the outer world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very much kind of tapping into a, you know, a mystical um, kind of enigmatic uh, presence and yet, you know, bringing in, you know, this world and kind of combining it with that other kind of otherly world as well, and then bringing it forth in, in the form of a, of a book. I'm a very spiritual person, you know, I, um, I'm a devout Catholic, and I strongly believe that I will meet my son again someday. And um, I don't know what he's going to look like. Um, but I know that he will be there and, and my father and my uncle. And uh, I lost two aunts um, also recently. Um, so that helped me as well. I, uh, when my son died, uh, it was my faith that helped me to um, continue and, and to move forward. And the community of faith that I was part of, um, all the people who supported me, my family, my, my work family, uh, 
my my parish. Um, all of these um, came into play in terms of helping me to survive what is really a an incredibly traumatizing um, thing. A mother should never never lose a son. Uh, so it's very difficult to keep going after something like that. Um, but you must, you must keep going. And so, and so I did, we did, my husband and I did, our family did. So. Yeah, I appreciate you, you sharing that. That is something that is, is almost, um, you know, one of the most difficult things for a, a mom to lose their child. It's, you know, that's, pretty, pretty high up there on one of the hardest things to, you know, really have to experience and, um, you know, to process all, all that comes with it. Um, I, I definitely want us to get to um, the uh, fourth universe, because we, we have to have like, a, you know, the, the whole complete set. But before we do that, um, let's touch a little bit about um, your love of words, your love of writing, your love of poetry, um, you know, to, you know, receive an MFA, um, you know, that's quite a lot of, you know, dedication and, um, you know, to be, uh, you know, receive that amount of, of schooling and whatnot. So can you just take us back a little bit to Celia, like growing up, like, did, were you always writing? How did this whole like passion and love begin? I wrote my first poem when I was six years old, you know, um, and, and I remember it clearly, it was about birds. And um, there was a, a girl bird in love with a boy bird who didn't love her back. Um, and I read voraciously as a child. Um, I'm an only child and I didn't have many friends growing up. Um, so I, I spent huge amounts of time um, reading and that's you know inter intimately interconnected with, with writing. So, um, when I started to think about, well, what do you want to be? <laughs> Silly old me thought that, hey, I'll be a writer. Um, you know, um, so that's why I went for the MFA, ironically, in fiction. Um, I considered myself a horrible poet. Um, I had been told <laughs> that I was a horrible poet. One of my professors uh, once made the comment that my poems were more like notes for poems. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten that. Um, and then somehow, you know, I wound up writing um, poetry instead. I, I, I have published a couple of short stories, but I, it's not something that I, I frequently do. Um, I started reading poetry as a teenager. Of course, I read Sylvia Plath, you know, and um, then I took some courses when I was in, um, in college that um, taught me to be a critical reader and, um, and opened me up to other writers. I was always very drawn to the confessional writers, um, you know, Adrian Rich. And um, I took a class with Maxine Pugin as part of my MFA. That was the thrill of a lifetime. She was so wonderful and not only a great poet, but a great teacher. Um, and um, the only reason why I, I've not been more prolific is because um, it is quite hard to make your living as a, as a writer. And um, the, the only thing that I knew how to do was teaching. And that's a very overwhelming uh, type of work. So it leaves you very little time to, um, to write and it drains you, it drains you of your creativity. So that even when you do have time to, to write, you you know, you don't you do something else. You just you space out in front of the television or, or something. So it's been a lifelong passion, but it's been difficult to, to get to where I'm at now. I love editing. I am having so much fun editing this journal. Um, it's really a dream for me to um, be able to put together uh, what I like, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing. And it's a journal focusing on new writers only. Um, we do not publish established writers. So, you know, there's another thrill to that, which is, you know, discovering the unknown, you know, it was me, I, I first published this person who may someday become famous. <laughs> so I'm having the time of my life right now um, with writing and, and editing. So, but it's been, it's been a lifelong thing. 
let's go ahead, Celia, and let's jump into the fourth multiverse. <laughs> the fourth one. The fourth one is the shortest one. Um, um, because the actually the the real one, there's a point in the book where I go back into the past. So there's a zero version, um, if you will. So there's, I think, only one or two or three poems in the in the fourth version. This one is a is a good one. Let's see. I don't know, it's about five of them. Okay. So this is version 4.43. I get the call to tell me I'm pregnant at work. And Maria, my boss, becomes the first to know. After 10 years of trying, I feel nothing but relief. My husband is more cautious. Let's not tell anyone just yet. Let's enjoy the secret. I agree. But after the next ultrasound, I hand my mother a glass of whiskey and I say, you're going to need this. She tells my dad and through the door, I hear him ask, how old is Lisette? But I was prepared for that. I revel in the things I allow myself to eat apple pie from Burger King, which is accidentally vegan, and ice cream, hot dogs and garlic fries dripping with grease. One day I feast on falafel and fries, followed by a nap. I wake up to pee and there on my panties is bright red blood. I start to scream, call Whitley, our nurse. Raphael thinks 911. We wind up in the car and in the ER, an ultrasound reveals a chorionic hematoma, a common cause of first trimester bleeding. You're still a mother, the tech whispers, while I hear Arturito's heart beating like a train. They put me on bed rest, which is fine because it's summer. I binge watch flip or flop and munch on carrots and hummus terrified of any meal over 500 calories. Every time I need to go to the bathroom, I have to psych myself. You're still a mother, I whisper over and over. Within two weeks, the cramps begin. I find myself calmly telling Raphael, it's time to go back to the ER. In the car, the cramps get so strong, I scream. This time the tech can find no heartbeat. For two weeks, I wait to see if somehow she was wrong until finally the doctor convinces me it's over, a missed abortion. Sometime before classes ended, I had gone to check my HCG levels. And after that, I bought a pair of brown flats. Arturito made me do it, I'd said to Rafael when I got home. How do you know it's a boy, he'd asked, to which I had responded, I just do. And he was, he was, and my uncle Arturito never knew. So this version has to do with the two miscarriages that I had um, before my daughter, Lucy. And as you can see, I planned on, on calling um, my child Arturo uh, for three separate times. I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Thank you. So, so beautiful. And I uh, so appreciate that you, you know, take us on with you that we experience, you know, what you experienced. And um, it's interesting also, Celia, now that we had a little bit of taste of um, all the four universes, it's a very interesting, um, not only um, processing all that you experienced, um, but a, a weaving of time, you know, it's just a loosening up of like the whole time space continuum as we uh, conventionally view it. And it's almost like very lucid, it's very dreamlike. And it has this like beautiful, like 
um, poetic feel just in and of its like fluidity? Um, you can read the book chronologically if you want to. If you pay attention to the titles of the poems, you can read each thread individually. But I chose to weave them together instead to juxtapose the feelings and the, what should I call it, the messages that each poem encapsulated. Um, so there comes a point in the book where you are lost and the past is being manifested you know along with the present and even the future as well and that was very intentional on my part because i feel like when my son passed time exploded on me everything that i had planned for and expected just fell apart um so it's very similar to what happens in the book, that feeling of disorientation and what's happening now, what's, what's going on. Um, things that we don't really talk about too much in this culture. You know, it's, it's very um, odd because you, we don't often hear people talking about miscarriage and infant loss. When I had my first miscarriage, women came out of the woodwork to tell me their stories about when they had miscarried. And I had never known. Uh, some of these women were very close friends or even relatives of mine. Um, and um, infant loss as well is, is almost taboo. Um, then when I lost my son, again, um, I remember even at the NICU, there were several nurses who said to me, you know, I lost my child too. And um, it's much more common than people believe. Um, one in four pregnancies ends in miscarriage in the first trimester. So I, I kind of felt obliged also to be as raw as, as necessary in this book, to not hold back on the, the shocking um, details of these experiences, because I think it's a disservice to women to always have this white lace kind of, you know, pink and fuzzy concept of motherhood, it doesn't happen for many of us. Um, for many of us, it's a, it's a real struggle. So I wanted to be hyper honest. You know, I wanted it to be very raw and, uh, and to mimic my own disorientation and my own inability to make sense of what was happening to me um with the book if you broke down the message of this book in, in a few ways and i love everything that, that you just shared um how would you express Celia, the, the message of multiverses that's a difficult question <laughs> i think that um the book speaks about love it is a message of endurance, of love enduring beyond even death, of the, the capacity to love beyond um, the passing of someone whom you counted on being there for you for, for a long time. Um, it's never easy. It's never easy to lose someone that you love. It doesn't matter if they're 26 days old or 97 years old. It's never enough. You know, you love someone, you want them with you. And um, this book is a yearning for that, for the ability to express love beyond the, the, our, physical, our physical presence in this world. So, I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And that's such a beautiful expression, Celia, of your heart and, and love and, you know, showing us a way of loving something that is very hard to come to terms with and something, you know, almost like expanding the definition of love, like moving out of a conventional mode. And um, also um, being a voice, I, I feel also, as, as you touched upon, uh, for uh, some, some subject matters that aren't necessarily, um, you know, written about or spoken about 
um, perhaps as much as some other ones. And you know, introducing your your uh, rawness and and honesty and 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 exactly like what you were experiencing, like really being true to like you know this is what it was. And then also bringing in you know some other aspects of like the whole concept of of multiverse and and you know parallel realities going on to kind of you know bring in you know tapping into this you know almost like mystical uh timelessness uh, aspect and then of course going back also to you know a beautiful beautiful tribute if you think about it love is timeless love is is it never ends you know i i've always sort of um had a double take when when they do marriage ceremonies and they say till death do us part i've never liked that part <laughs> i've always thought no 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 wait um what about after you know what will it be like after will it, will my husband not be my husband anymore <laughs> so um I, I i i really believe that love endures love endures and um in my heart everyone whom I've lost is still alive and I talk to them in my head and I think they hear me sometimes. So I really believe that. Yeah. We have a few more minutes left. Is there anything, Celia, about multiverses that we haven't tapped in on or anything else that you'd like to share about the book before we wrap things up? Um, maybe I can read you the last poem so that you can see um, the future aspect of it. Um, so far, I've only read things that happened in the past, but the poem ends um, about 20 years or so into the, the, the book ends about 20 years or so into the future. Um, this is version 2.90. It's been years now since my parents died. And now it's Raphael and I who are the grandparents. Lucy grows up to be a doctor, a cardiologist. She marries the son of an old friend and they have twins, both boys. She names them after my father and her brother, Francisco and Arturo. Sarah grows up to be a commercial architect. She's known for buildings that appear to wobble but don't fall. She's a bohemian type, dresses in bandanas and goes barefoot. She has two little girls, Lucia and Sonia for my mom. Somehow I have trouble imagining what Arturo will finally be. He drops out of college to paint, then meets a girl he follows to Morocco. When he comes back, he's unshaven and skinny as a string, heartbroken. He shuffles around in his sweatpants, watching tennis on TV. On Thanksgiving, we are a crowd, almost a full dozen. The kids stayed vegan. The tofurkey takes center stage. And then we all pass around the plates. Lucy's hair darkened to a soft brown and Sarah and Arturo's more a dirty blonde. Their kids look nothing like me, but they call it they call out grandma, grandma, always wanting something, another piece of pie, a glass of water. I can't but stand and watch them. Raphael's eyes catch mine. It is one of those moments that stretches time. Here we are, we say to each other without words. And then the moment's gone, little Lucy going up to Raphael and hugging his knees. Pop, 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 carry me. What a beautiful way to end multiverses. It's um, it's a fantasy, obviously, but um, it's it's what I would have liked, you know, the the big rambunctious family, all of them vegan. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and I love that you you play with reality. You you have like you you know, bring like almost like as a child with toys, you, you just kind of play with it and potential and, and reality. And that, what a fantastic um, way, way to um, end multiverses. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, so we do need to wrap the show up, Celia. 
Um, we always leave the guest, um, we kind of pass the mic on to you, however you'd like to close out the show. And also let us know how we can stay connected with you and let us know how we can get a copy of Multiverses. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to, to share this book with you and, and everyone who, who will see this later on. Um, I wanted to announce that um, I do have another book coming out um, next year called Bodies and Words. So if you um, want to keep up with me and my work, um, the best way to do so is um, to go to my personal website, um, which is celialisettealvarez.com, just, just my name as one word. And um, there you can find all my social media links, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, and um, you can buy multiverse, uh, multiverses um, on Amazon uh, is the easiest way. Um, but if you can, um, please publish it. Uh, please uh, buy it from Finishing Line Press, who published it, um, so that we can support their, their work, um, which is um, wonderful. This is my second book with them, and they're a lovely, lovely small press. So finishinglinepress.com, if, if possible. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Thank you so much, Celia, for sharing your Multiverses book and um, such a deep and moving and uh, touching um, you know, subject matter to deal with. And I also just wanted to commend again your bravery and, and um, being so courageous in um, presenting all that you went through in, in such a, a beautiful way and then you know, sharing it out for, to others because that takes a lot of courage. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I don't know. I don't know about courageous. I, I only know that um, I felt like it was something I had to do. Mm -hmm. So I did it. <laughs> so, but thank you very much for that thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celia, for being our guest and, and sharing so much of your life with us and um, your book and also sharing with us your journey. And um, stay in touch with us at that new book on the horizon sounds, sounds um, very, very interesting. And I mean, the whole title is, you know, already compelling and captivating. It's, uh, it's from a quotation uh, from Joyce Carol Oates. She says that in love, there are two things, bodies and words. Mm -hmm. And um, I took that as my inspiration for the book. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you again, Celia, for being our guest today on Art and Talk. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching Art and Talk. We appreciate the time you take to watch our artists' videos and draw inspiration from them. Please stay connected with us on our YouTube channel, on Facebook, and Twitter. We appreciate your support. And we'll talk soon on the next Art and Talk. Until then, be well and be blessed.